Gentlemen, welcome back to the T. Shanley starting a business, building a brand blog. This one, big number, 265. So I got some amazing news, I got some crappy news, and I've got some might be crappier news too. Um, <laughs> does that make any sense? Anyway, let me explain. I also have some business questions that we're going to get to. All right. So the first order of business, I got to say, whoa, mama, T. Shanley has just officially shipped our one millionth box. One, mil one million, that's such a big number. I don't know what it is about a million, right? It's like, that is just like the number that's like, damn, like 100,000 was awesome, 200,000 was awesome, but a million, that is pretty monumental and sweet. Something else that's sweet is all of your support. Guys, thank you so much. From the bottom of my heart, Rob's heart, the chemist's heart, and the entire, did I say Kelly? And Kelly, he's actually got a heart once in a while. The entire T. Shanley family, we just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for, for letting us be on your face and keep you handsome, honestly, and for taking a chance on us. You have your choice, you know, what skincare company you use. And, uh, and, and the fact that you would trust, trust us, use us, and continue to support us is just amazing and um, you know we couldn't do any of this without you you know our goal at T. Shanley is to help you look and feel amazing and you know one million boxes baby that is a lot of, of, of amazingness a lot of handsomeness a lot of skincare um, you know to think that when when I told people when I was starting this business like no I, I told people that I wanted to do like a skincare company a very common response was dudes don't use skincare why they're not gonna that's a stupid idea is it <laughs> apparently not Guys, you are so amazing, and I just want to thank you once again for, for taking a chance on us and, and spending your hard-earned dinero with our you know, up-and-coming, scrappy grooming company. We are in the process of trying to just kick more ass than ever. We are constantly trying to innovate. We are trying to add new products and make your experience at Teach Hanley the best it can possibly be. Every day, every day, every day our goal is to make you happier honestly it's not to make us rich it's to make you happier like that is our goal at t shanley as a company everything we do is to help you from the website to the interface to the products to the speed of delivery to the customer service we are here to help you that is our sole goal in this company not to mention make you handsome that's a nice byproduct help you be handsome a million times thank you now let's talk about some crappy news um so my wife and I have been quite diligent in trying to stay, you know, safe and, and COVID free for, you know, since, since March. I literally have not been in the gym um, since March. Now, you know, I, I have the luxury of having a, a, a workout like room in my house, but that's just to show you like how serious I do take it. Now, I don't want to get the, like, I, like, that's the thing that just drives me crazy when people are like, oh, it's political, it's this, it's that, it's because of the, like, 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 like seriously? Like, I'm not trying to make any type of political statement, but the fact is there is something bad going on and I don't, don't want to catch it. But um, I've, I've, I've literally, I've, I've done the best job I could to stay safe. But um, recently, as of this past week, we found out that Tracy's mother, who we have been caring for, she doesn't like live with us, but she's in an assisted facility, assisted living facility, like across the street, and we get to go in like once a week for like a socially distanced wear a mask uh, visit. We found out that um, that her community was had had one of the staff members had COVID, and it's like crap, right? And as you know, um, COVID in, in senior centers is bad news, right? My grandmother Nana actually had it. She, I think she beat it, but, but she passed away since then. And so the doctors are actually saying that she did, um, you know, have some complications, even though she was like not, like didn't have COVID anymore. Like she still um, had issues and never really recovered fully since having that. Um, she was also 90, 90, like two or three. So um, I'm not sure. Did I tell you that my grandmother died? Did I tell you that my grandmother passed away a few months ago? Did I forget that? Or actually, did I choose to keep that private and not want to talk about it? Because anyway, I'm not sure if I told you that or not. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, we got the call that, hey, there's, there's an issue at her nursing home. And so we need you, or your, your mother-in-law, my, my wife's mother, um, came in contact with this person. We need you to go take her to get tested. My wife's like, uh, okay. And so, which first off, I think is crazy. The fact that they're at a nursing home and they made like us go take her to get tested as opposed to like, hey, you obviously have a problem at your place. Why aren't you calling in like, like some like group testing facility? 
Anyway, not my, not, my, my, not my business, apparently. So anyway, my wife had to take her to get tested. Now, my wife wore a mask. My, my mother-in-law kind of wore a mask. Like, ever, if you ever see, like, somebody, like, kind of wearing a mask, that's kind of what she did. Anyway, she had to sit in the car with her for, you know, 30, 40 minutes. They went to the drive-thru. They did the test. My wife's test came back negative. Of course it would. She's just now in contact with her mother-in-law. But my mother-in-law uh, came in, uh, actually the test came in today, that she is positive. Now, she doesn't have any like symptoms or anything like that, but uh, both, of, uh, both Tracy and I saw uh, my mother-in-law on Saturday. We were at like, we were doing like this socially distanced like visit where it's like six feet across and, and anyway. So now it's a huge waiting game <laughs> because we have both been exposed to somebody with COVID. My wife was really exposed. Um, I, you know, am kind of exposed because I was there and I saw her and then I live with my wife. And so um, at, this pay, at this point, it's literally just a waiting game. Um, we've got, you know, some tests scheduled. I've got a test tomorrow that I'm going to go. She's going on Friday and then we're going to go the following week because it's just crazy. And, um, you know, it sucks. For those of you who have experienced it or, or have actually had COVID, you know, it just sucks. The waiting game, right? Like at this point, it's like, shit, I was exposed. What now? Now, now I just wait and I isolate, right? And so since Monday, my wife and I have been isolating and um, I've actually been isolating myself from her. I've been sleeping in the basement. She's upstairs. Like it's just trying to, trying to stay safe. But, um, you know, it just sucks. It really sucks. And it's got me kind of a little bit stressed out. I got to be honest, and it, it stresses me out that I'm worried about my mother-in-law, my wife, myself, and, uh, you know, we'll get through it, though, <laughs> one way or another, and I just wanted to sort of give you an update um, to stay safe. You know, I know that things are crazy, and here's the crazy thing. Like, my wife and I literally have been really diligent. Like, Thanksgiving, we just had it, her and I, my mother didn't come over. Like, we're really trying to be, you know, vigilant about, about staying safe. But it seems like it's all just like closing in around us. And um, I just want to tell you to be safe. Um, don't take your health for granted. And, uh, you know, do what you need to do. Wear a mask. And this isn't a political statement. It's just don't be stupid. So anyway, sorry if that was a little bit of a buzzkill. I just wanted to let you know kind of what I'm dealing with, what we're dealing with as a family. And uh, I, will, I will update you if, um, you know, if I end up getting it. I will, uh, I will let you know. So... Anyway, stay safe. Now, let's, 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 let's bring the mood up a little bit, all right? Let's talk a little bit about your business questions because there were some of them that I absolutely love. Actually, I love all of them, but, but there's a few of them that we're actually going to talk about, all right? The first business question is, this is such a cute question. When I saw this, I was like, that's so cute. It's from our friend Vetus Betus. He says, business question. When is it appropriate to call yourself an entrepreneur? Wow. Like, I never thought about that. Actually, I have thought about that because, um, you know, it was, I guess, you can call yourself an entrepreneur when you decide that you want to do something amazing and you want to start a business. You don't have to be an entrepreneur in terms of have like a business or a failure or whatever, but when you make the decision that you are going to do something, that is the point at which you are an entrepreneur. You don't need to make millions of dollars. You just need to make the decision that this is a path that you are going to go down. Um, now, if you really want to be like a seasoned entrepreneur, you got to try, fail, try some more, fail a little bit more, and then eventually make something that actually works. Um, that was actually my, uh, my, my path. And so you just need to make sure that you do not allow other people to basically steal your joy, steal your thunder. You are amazing, right? And the entrepreneurial spirit is alive. Now, there are some people that are like, like, like fake entrepreneurs. These are people that are like, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, but they never actually do. They never actually get off their ass. They never actually put themselves out there. But if you are going to put yourself out there and you actually do, congratulations, you are an entrepreneur. Now you got to make it work. The next comment isn't actually a business comment, but it kind of is. And I just thought it was funny. It's from our friend Felipe Vital. He says, I can see uh, you're, or why you're a little shaky talking about money, but man, you've made it. I can tell how much work you've put in. You've earned it, so relax, LOL. Um, I hate talking about money. It makes me so uncomfortable for some reason. And it seems like every time I, I talk to somebody in terms of like an entrepreneur or a podcast, that is the thing that, that people want to talk about. It's money. It's the bottom line because it's sexy. And I know this, but I think it's the poor little Italian kid from Philly 
that still has a difficult time. And also, that whole Italian thing, I got this crazy amount of guilt, right? Italian guilt is a real thing. And, um, and even though I'm not, I don't feel guilty about being successful, I don't feel guilty about working hard and, and making products that people love, I still feel uncomfortable and a little bit easy. I also am super hyper aware or feel like it could all vanish in a second if I make like one bad decision. And so um, I'm very aware of it, but I love talking business. I love talking entrepreneurship. It's what gets me up in the morning. It's what gets me excited. From the age of 12 years old, I knew I wanted to own a fitness center. Like I started down my entrepreneurial journey when I was 12 years old because I knew what I wanted to do. And then boom, not straight line, boom, 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 crooked line, speed bumps, and bankruptcy, but ultimately I continue to, uh, to go down that path. And, and entrepreneurship is something that I absolutely love. One of the things and signs that you are a successful entrepreneur in many people's eyes though is the bottom line, how much money you make. But it's still, and, and, and I've said this on another vlog, one of the other reasons why I hate talking about money is that I feel like when people do, when people lead with X dollars or whatever, it cheapens the spirit or the reason why you did or you're doing what you did. Now, now here's the thing. There are some like online gurus that sell like systems that are gonna help you. <laughs> I, I, I cannot stand these online people that, that try to tell you how you're gonna be rich and all you gotta do is buy their course. And <laughs> I've been getting spammed apparently by, apparently some of them have my email address. I've been getting spammed with the holiday season about buy my $27,000 $1,000 course for $15. Like right now, hurry, act now or else. Anyway, <laughs> and I don't know why I don't unsubscribe. I think I'm a glutton for punishment or I just like keep my eyes on, on, on people that, uh, that I think are shady. Anyway, um, one of the things that really bothers me, <laughs> what am I talking about? Now there are some people that talk about money. That is their business talking about money and investing like Graham Stephan, love his stuff. I think he does an incredible job and he is definitely not shy. Noah Kagan, another guy, super amazing entrepreneur, not shy about talking about money. I, on the other hand, am very shy about talking about money. I love talking business and, I, and, and like I was saying, I think the reason why I am so sort of not comfortable talking about money is um, I feel like it cheapens and robs the spirit of the, the reason why you did or you do whatever you do. You know, the reason why I wanted to start a business and be successful was never to make like a lot of money. Success to me doesn't equal money. Happiness, fulfillment, being able to make a difference in people's life, lives, this is what happiness means to me. In the process, if I can make a buck, great, but, uh, but that's not the reason why I get up every morning to do what I do. The next business question comes from our friend Brodrin. Biden or old. <laughs> Whoa, I've butchered some names, but this one, uh, this takes a cake. Anyway, he says, my business partner just left me because he didn't want to work as an entrepreneur. Should I find a new business partner or just uh, do all the stuff myself? And the answer is that that all depends. That all depends on you. It all depends on what your business partner brought to the table. If he brought a skill set that you don't have, you either need to do it yourself or you need to hire somebody that's gonna be able to do what, what they were doing. Um, I think that what I would probably recommend at this point is try and do it yourself. See if you can you know, figure it out. See if you, if you need the help. And before you give away equity to somebody who promises you that they're gonna be able to do X, Y, and Z, you really need to make sure that they are able to walk the walk. Because there are a lot of people, if you go to somebody like, hey, do you wanna be my business partner? They'll be like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Meaning like, hey, you've already done the work. But they, you've done the work and I'm just gonna come along for the ride because the, the, the term entrepreneurship and entrepreneur is a sexy term, right? Like you see a lot of fake entrepreneurs and people in like, like Instagram and, and on their profiles in like their description, they'll say entrepreneur or hustler or whatever. It's just kind of silly. Anyway, real entrepreneurs actually have their business listed, just, just FYI. That's how you can decipher some of the, uh, the real, real people from the fake people. But um, you just need to make sure that before you give away equity of something you've worked incredibly hard at, you need to make sure that you actually need that, that help. You also need to make sure that they are able to do what they say they're gonna do. Because a lot of people talk their ass off, but in terms of execution, that's where things get buzzy. The next business question comes from our friend Patrick Hadley. He says, I'm a 22 year old who's interested in opening a barber shop. I've put in the work to learn the skills to a level of noticeability or notoriety and acquired a client base, clientele based uh, reasonably, si so reasonably sized client base, 
What suggestions do you have, Alpha, when making a business plan? Um, where should I look for the capital to start? Small business loan, investor, etc. How do I manage personal bills? Home, rent, vehicle payment from business bills, shop, rent, blah, blah, blah. I believe for the first few quarters or even years of the business, I would only acquire enough money to cover um, either personal or business bills. I don't want to uh, bite off more than I can chew. Any advice is appreciated. So this is a great question, an, an amazing question, honestly. Congratulations for one, for you know, doing the work, building your skills, and then you know, building a client base. So you got revenue coming in. You, before you start like trying to do like a business plan, like I get it, right? You want to start a barber shop. Are there ways for you to do this on a smaller scale? Maybe a better solution is to, not, not better solution, but I don't know where you're actually doing these cuts. Is it, is it at home? Is it at somebody else's studio? Are you renting a chair from somebody else? You know, trying to figure out and decipher, you know, sort of like what the current situation is really is going to dictate what the next step is. If you're currently doing things at home, maybe the next step is to go rent a chair at a barber shop to start, sort of learn sort of everything you can about that industry. Also, build your client base a little bit more. And um, that's something that uh, my buddy Christian, um, you, you guys remember the dude who, who uh, cut my hair a few times in the Alpha M YouTube channel? Anyway, he, uh, he worked at a barber shop. He rented a chair, it was X number of hundreds of dollars a week, and he kept everything on top of that. Things changed though as the barbershop got busier and he decided, you know what, the deal here has changed so much, I wanna go out on my own. And so what he does now is he, go, he went to one of those like salon suites, it's a, it's a building that basically rents out like salon like rooms. Um, you bring all your product, you bring your chair, you bring your client. The downside to those places is that you have like zero walk-in business. The upside to a storefront like a barbershop, you're gonna get a lot of foot traffic depending on the location. You're also gonna have like people that'll just walk in and be like, yo, I need a, a cut and, and you'll be picking up some, some revenue from there. In terms of opening your own shop, I really think you need to figure out what all of your expenses are going to be. What are they gonna be? And if you can pay the bills, it sounds like you can't pay the bills, um, for the barbershop and your personal expense just with you. And so what I would possibly do is look for some people that are interested in maybe not necessarily going in with you, but hey, I'm looking to do this. Would you like to you know, join me? So that maybe you could get some, some you know, breathing room before you actually open the door and take all the risk. You've got people that you sort of know are gonna come and bring their clients because every barber that you add, that's additional revenue if they're bringing their client base with you. And so maybe that's, that's the next step. In terms of you know, paying your bills, you gotta do that first. In terms of saving a little bit of money, I would definitely see if you can cut your expenses down so that you can save more to eventually afford a down payment on like a lease or a small shop. But one of the big mistakes that a lot of business owners make, not just like hair salon or, or barbers, is they go too big too soon. They're baby steps, gradual steps that you should take in order to start something and grow it, as opposed to just, yo, here I am, you've got all this overhead, all this expense, and it's, it's scary because you don't know if you're gonna be able to pay not only your rent on, and your bills and your staff at the location, but also your, your personal bills. More importantly, you've gotta eat. But incredible question, good luck, I'm proud of you. And the last business question is something that I know a little bit about. It is about fitness, it's also about YouTube, and it's about promotions. All right, so our friend says, I've recently started working on a fitness channel with a friend. Excuse me. Um, if we're to try and grow the channel and leverage our audience to sell fitness related products, do you think, given how saturated fitness markets are, that it could be viable? For instance, if we're selling gym apparel or perhaps something more specific, more niche? The answer is yes, you should do it. The answer is no, it's not too saturated. You see all the time, there are a gazillion fitness influencers, and a lot of them are doing really well. And you know, the fact is, you're gonna have your unique voice you're gonna come at things a little bit different. There are so many amazing fitness guys on YouTube, but that doesn't mean there's not room for more. Also, the apparel thing, like Christian Guzman over at Alpha Elite, you know, just absolutely dominating it. Now, does he get as many views as some of these other companies? No. Do I think he's killing it on a level that none of these other guys pretty much are doing in terms of the fitness industry because he built a brand around his apparel? Um, 
you know, the answer is yeah. I mean, I think he's absolutely crushing it. But then his friend, Max, built a channel, built his, you know, line of clothing, and is doing really well. David and How to Beast started a channel, does promotions, more lifestyle, you know, stuff, but he has a very strong fitness focus. He's also doing his edge apparel, which is, is doing really well. I don't know the numbers of any of these people, but I know that they're selling out at all these launches. David at How to Beast also started an app to get people like onto their phone. He's done like a workout plan and program called the Beastly app. Um, Max has started like a sour candy business. Like there are so many different genres and areas. Once you build an audience that believes in you, that trusts you, sky is the limit kind of thing. And so do not allow the fact that there are other people doing similar things to dissuade you from actually going after your dreams because I know for a fact you can do it. Gentlemen, that is where I'm gonna wrap things up. Thank you so much. From the bottom of my heart, the entire Tiege Hanley teams and one million knuckle bumps and double mung strap love sending. Thank you so much for everything, guys. We just hit a huge benchmark and milestone for us. It's been a hard ride. It's been an enjoyable ride. And we've got big things in store for not only ourselves at Tiege Hanley, but you as well. Guys, thank you for everything. We love you.